thank you so much for joining us today um, on our webinar. Uh, I'm Professor Jill Klein, and together with my colleague Amanda Sinclair, Sinclair, I'll be facilitating today's discussion. In the spirit of recon reconciliation, Melbourne Business School acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, traditional custodians of the land which the school's buildings stand. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community, and pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today's session focuses on leadership, which allows us to reflect upon the courage and impact of First Nations leaders. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. So this seminar will run for an hour. Um, we'll hear from our two guest speakers and we'll leave time for Q&A at the end of the hour. We'd love to hear your questions and you can submit them through the Q&A function at any time uh, during the session and I'll be monitoring that. And if you see a question submitted that you would also like to be answered, like you're thinking, oh yeah, I was wondering that too, um, you can upvote it by pressing the thumbs up button and that moves it higher on my, my list and makes it more likely that we can ask that question. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce my wonderful colleague, Amanda Sinclair. Um, she's been a leader at MBS, a pioneer in the view that leadership does not have to come from a single mold, a single right way to lead things. And that was kind of a view that, that came from a world where there wasn't a whole lot of diversity in uh, leaders. And as diversity has grown, you know, so have alternative leadership styles. And some of these styles, which, you know, Amanda has, uh, has, studied and taught people about can create healthier workplaces than traditional workplaces have been. Um, and a lot of her work has said that these, these alternative leadership styles should be encouraged and allowed to flourish. And so with that, Amanda, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jill. And fantastic to see so many of you able to join us today for this really um, important and timely topic of leadership for the new world of work. So what 2020 and COVID has really taught us is that the leadership task has changed. What we're hoping for and looking for and needing in our leaders has really undergone significant transformation in the last uh, six, nine, 12 months. And, you know, for somebody like me who studies leadership, this is a really great thing. You know, this is an opportunity to really rethink our organizations and the way we lead them, given the dramatic changes in our ways of working. A big question, of course, is, you know, will these changes in how we're organizing and leading be lasting? And how will we sustain the good things that we've learned as well as the, um, as well as adapt to, you know, the uncertain conditions going forward? So for these questions, uh, we have two amazing panelists that I'll introduce you to in a moment. Um, both of these leaders have really been at the front end of very rapid changes in terms of the multicultural and uh, diverse nature of their workforces, their clients, the people they're serving. So they're gonna join uh, with me and, and Jill in asking, we're gonna explore a few questions that we have prepared. But uh, very shortly, we'll move over and, and respond to some of the questions that you've already asked uh, in expressing your interest in attending. And please do, as Jill said, uh, note down in the um, Q&A section anything that you'd really like to put to our two incredible panelists. So firstly, let me introduce Jodie Oster. Jodie started out her professional career as an emergency physician. And if that wasn't challenging enough for her, uh, she, she took on an MBA at Melbourne Business School and moved into uh, Bain and Company in a consulting role. And then later uh, packed her bags and set off uh, to Silicon Valley to be a leading um, entrepreneur in a couple of different startups. Jodie's currently the general manager of Uber Eats Asia Pacific and so has fairly recently taken on a whole new role uh, in terms of leading the company into that market. Jodie is also an incredible alumni of Melbourne Business School and in 2017 was awarded Outstanding Alumni 
for uh, her incredible commitment, not just to her entrepreneurial ventures, but to, to the sort of wider social good of what uh, innovation and leadership can de deliver. Our other panelist is Susan Ogden, and Susan also has a great long standing connection with MBS. I first met Susan on a leadership program at Mount Eliza. And uh, as the principal of Dandenong High School, I was just struck by the fact that Susan is an amazing CEO, and she is a CEO. This is uh, Dandenong High School is one of the largest secondary schools in Australia. It is also one of the most multicultural with more than 60 nationalities and languages represented among the student body and of course the wider client base, which is the families. Listening to Susan talk about uh, the kinds of kids that uh, the school is developing, the kinds of issues that she is working with um, and in a very real sense, the secondary school is the safe place for many of the students. It's the place where families make connections and see futures, new futures. So again, an incredible role Susan's played in transforming, uh, in leading and transforming uh, those communities. So with those uh, introductory remarks, I'd like to put to both our panelists and perhaps you Jodie first, you know, what are one or, one or two of the key insights that you've learned about yourself as leader about how you approach leadership and how you've approached leadership differently through this period. I wonder if you could share a couple of examples uh, with our sure audience. Can. I think what's been really interesting is, you know, I, I'm, I'm a passionate um, advocate of diversity and not just diversity, but inclusion uh, at work and, you know, in, in all circumstances. And I think Uber's been very sort of vocal and active in this, in this space in the last few years. But, what I think has been really interesting to remember about inclusion through COVID is um, people have really individual struggles, no matter how good they appear to have it from your perspective. And so it's been a really important reminder for me that uh, what's, what appears to be hard or easy for me is really experienced very differently for each person on my team. And so the need to really know your team as, as whole human beings and to understand their experience is absolutely critical. For example, I am a parent and my partner works full time and everybody working and, and studying at home uh, was you know, really difficult for me during the first lockdown in Melbourne. And I thought, gosh, imagine how good it is for those people who are living by themselves. And then you talk to the people who are living by themselves and they're like, I have never felt such deep loneliness as I do now. And I wish that I had a house full of people to navigate um, this with me. And so, you know, you sort of always cover the grass is always greener on, on their side, but actually everybody has their own individual struggles. And so really knowing and understanding people's stories is, is so critical um, to be able to be truly inclusive. Um, just one more example on that is because I lead teams across Asia, the physical living space that you're in um, makes a huge, a huge difference. I'm presenting the panel. Um, sorry. Um, so, um, sorry, it's clearly uh, being disrupted here. So, um, the, the physical living space that you're in makes a big difference. And I've got a lot of colleagues who are in Asia in really small one bedroom apart apartments with kids, with partners who are working. And, um, and you know, we have much more space, most of us in, in Australia. And so just th that example was another one that I hadn't really anticipated as difficult. Uh, so that, that's just, you know, a, a really strong insight for me during this, these last few months. Fantastic. And, and we're sort of also seeing the way in which life intrudes on work, you know, in your example at the moment. Um, could I just uh, follow up with one question? And that is, have you made extra efforts then to seek to understand that those differences that, you know, the different living conditions, the different issues, uh, and how have you gone about really getting a grasp of that? I think the first step is to be aware that there are differences. And so just having heightened, uh, I, I think, 
visual and kind of auditory awareness, you know, when you are talking to people, like look at where they're sitting, um, if you can see it, if they don't have their green screen on, you know, is it a big space or a small space and um, ask them, you know, where are they? Or if they're having trouble with their internet, you know, ask them about their internet connection. Um, because that may be a really much bigger problem, whether financial or, or environmental for them. Uh, but the other thing that I've probably more proactively done is uh, because I started this, um, this Asia pack role as COVID hit, I actually needed to get to know whole new teams that I was leading remotely. And uh, so I have actually spent a lot of time inventing Zoom icebreakers where you've got big groups of people online and actually using the background. If you're on an enterprise um, Zoom account, people can upload all sorts of pictures and really using it as prompts for really interesting conversation about who you are and where you come from. You know, upload uh, a photo of your happy place or upload a photo of something that represents your family situation. Depending on kind of what you want to get to know about your team, uh, icebreakers generally, I think, are really important and powerful, um, but modifying those for um, a WebEx or a Zoom uh, scenario, you have to be a little bit creative. If you don't have the Zoom backgrounds, you can get people to hold up, uh, hold up drawings, but really trying to draw out personal information in creative ways like that. Mm, mm, fantastic. So can I come to you now, Susan? You know, what, what are some of the insights about yourself as a leader? What have you learned um, through this period? Well, I've got some similar um, experiences to Jody and some similar insights, but I'm going to focus on two. But just before I do, I want to pick up on something you said, Amanda, about the community that I lead. So, um, because I think that's really important um, in terms of the insights that I'm going to share. So, we are a large um, school, so that means we've got um, a large number of students and families. Um, we have about 235 staff. Um, and I have a large um, leadership team and we're in a really low socioeconomic area with incredible disadvantage as well as highly multicultural and for all schools, um, for all communities, schools are really important. Um, for our school, because many of our students are coming from war-torn um, um, trauma or war-torn backgrounds from overseas, many have had dislocation, school is really significant to them because it's not just about their learning, which of course all schools provide learning, um, it's also about a place where they feel safe, they have connection and they develop a learning confidence. And so during this COVID experience, I don't think 2020 is a year any of us will forget. During this COVID experience, we've had um, two uh, periods of remote learning when suddenly we had to switch very quickly to learning online. But we also had a school closure in the middle of three weeks where school was taken away for all of us. Um, that meant that we couldn't come on site, any of us couldn't. And not only that, we went, we had 24 days of stage five restrictions. We actually celebrated when we went to stage four because it was a, a step up. Stage five, which meant we couldn't leave our houses while we were going through contact tracing because we had a number of positive cases um, at the school. So I just wanted to set um, that context because that's the background to the, the insight that I've had. I think there are two things that jump out for me for two, in two different time periods um, through that journey. The first is um, learning um, the importance of being explicit with your team in articulating what you want their leadership to look like. Because in the first remote learning, we had very little time to move to that. And I think um, I wasn't really clear about what I wanted my core executive team and leaders to do, what support both for me and the small executive team of three needed to look like, um, particularly about coming onto site, because it's very mindful, people have different home situations, like Jody, they have small children at home and, and lots of different personal situations. And I wasn't really explicit. In fact, I made assumptions that they would know. And then during that six weeks, I became increasingly frustrated where they weren't providing the support that I needed. They were doing great work in terms of the small uh, part, part that they were responsible for within their community. But as a, a strong leadership team of 10, they weren't really leading across the organisation or across the school. And I often in communication with staff talked about the importance of um, not judging people and not making assumptions and understanding everybody's perspective is different. And then I did exactly that without even realising that was what I was doing. 
Um, so much so that I was really frustrated and I planned when we came back to get them all together um, I have a very strong conversation about um, uh, realignment and what um, our work needed to look like and did we need to redefine leadership because I felt let down. And then, I'm glad I didn't do that, I then suddenly decided that what was really important for everybody, for students as well, there's a, we have what I called re-entry conversations where we just have a conversation and we listen to each other about what our experience has been. And so I did that with my leadership team of um, nine and I, I was blown away. I'm glad I listened. I was very trying to, to, to ex, um, demonstrate mindful leadership. I'm glad I listened before I spoke. Um, and I was blown away by the different perspectives, by the fears. Two of my leaders had not left the house in six weeks because they were, they were scared of being infected by the virus. Whereas others thought that they were giving me the support that I needed. And I, so I, I, I've learned, I certainly learned through that, not to make assumptions, that you have to be really clear, which the second time going into remote learning I did. And it's been fantastic. It's been one of the greatest experiences in terms of bringing the leadership team together because we've raised those issues and we've raised them quite openly. And we've defined at key times um, during the eight weeks this time, um, what our work needed to be. So that was the, the first one. Um, the second one was during the lockdown, which I have to say and be honest about, was one of the, the most intense and difficult times in my leadership. And I've learned and I've worked very closely with Amanda and Richard Searle and other people um, through your organisation. I've learned the importance of trying not to take things personally in leadership and have positive self-talk and, and maintain distance and all of that. And I found myself almost insidiously being um, caught up in, in losing uh, an understanding of what my responsibilities were. And it became very, very personal. Because after 23 weeks, we still didn't have a reopening date. And we had families who have nine children in the house and two parents in the three bedroom house that hadn't been able to go out and do prop sh uh, shopping properly, who hadn't been able to work, who were doing what I asked them to do, but were coming intensely frustrated. I had teachers the same, and there was constant pressure on what was happening, and there was all sorts of miscommunication with DHHS, and we didn't know. Mm -hmm. And without realising it, I started to take that incredibly personally. And I think my insight is that um, at some point, and I'll explain the point, my insight is that as a leader, you can't be responsibility, you can't be responsible for everything. And it's really important to be conscious about what you can be responsible for. So um, you can't be responsible for other people's well-being. You can't fix a pandemic. You can't, no matter how hard you try, convince DHHS to reopen because it doesn't work. Um, and there was a moment when um, the pressure was building and I was so frustrated and I got bad news from DHHS and I was going to have to go to the school community and say it'll be another week which I was dreading to do, and I was in tears in my study. And I heard my two boys walking past. It was my son's 25th birthday. And I was supposed to make a birthday cake. And um, I'm a high achiever, so it was a six layer uh, lemon and pistachio cake. Um, and because the phone call from DHHS came, um, the, the flour and the ingredients were on the bench. And my two boys walked past, and one of them said, good luck, I'm getting a cake now. Um, heard that, school again. And I heard them going up the stairs and I suddenly thought, what am I doing here? I'm putting all this energy and my time with my family into something I can't change or influence. Yes, my community need communication, but I can't give them the answer they want, but I can find other things to talk to them about. And I can find other ways to deal with this and I cannot focus on what we don't have and what we've lost, but I can look at what we've still got. And I can then talk about, so what are we going to do because we're in a situation that we can't change. Um, so I guess defining and understanding and continually checking in with yourself um, that um, there are things as a leader that you can do and there are things that you can't. And one of the things we've all learned through COVID is that um, any control that we thought we had is absolutely an illusion. Yeah. Fantastic and, and such a lot of um, beautiful insights there about also, you know, getting perspective when things are getting, um, feeling overwhelming and using those nice little rituals like baking a cake to help you kind of remember 
um, what you can control and what you can't, and the importance of, of nurturing, uh, nurturing those close. So I want to uh, build on that and ask you each, if you would mind reflecting on, on how have you helped you know, your, your organisations, your team members, your exec uh, peers and colleagues, to have you helped them stay connected the sort of the practicalities of that given that you know we've all been working uh, remotely how have you helped them uh, feel purpose um, and perhaps related to that you know a lot of theorists say that you know you should never waste a good uh, crisis like this that you know perhaps it is an opportunity to get people to reconnect with core values and purposes. You know, how have you gone about doing some of those things? Jody? can I start with you? Sure. Um, I think uh, I, I will say I'm lucky that we had a lot of the sort of communication structures in place already. And so for me, it was dialing up the frequency of those and maybe um, altering some of the messaging a little bit to be, uh, I want to say, you know, like I like to be thoughtful and authentic always, but it's almost like take, slowing down and taking more time to share during those forums when maybe we would have been a bit more business, you know, business first before and now there's, there's a bit more time for sharing. So I'll give you some examples. You know, we have um, regular all hands at a global, regional and country level. We also have town halls for sub, sub teams and if there are specific topics, we have a really active Slack channel for, for those who aren't familiar with Slack. It's a uh, it's the, the sort of internal chat channel that we use. Um, you know, Zoom is a way of life for me. I would say my actual work hasn't changed that much because I spent 100% of my time on Zoom before and it's 100% uh, during COVID anyway. So all of those things were in place anyway. Um, so increasing the frequency absolutely uh changing to um instead of written slack engagement with my broader team to do a lot of video engagement so i will often post a two to three minute video on that slack channel so that they can hear and see me instead of just my words uh, because they might otherwise have done that in person as i traveled around the region and to their teams and then adding uh some sort of fun and personal content that I suppose uh, changes. It, it's a replacement for those water cooler conversations or the dinners that you might have if you're physically present in those markets. So we actually had a talent show, um, one all hands that was, I mean, I think I cried. It was so fantastic, you know, really talented people just doing their best sitting in their lounge room performing and people just loved it. Um, I've taken you know, one of those two minute videos in the garden with my kids um, instead of giving a, a business update. Um, we had a dedicated all hands yesterday about our employee resource, resource groups, which are for women at Uber and um, Pride at Uber and, um, you know, all sorts of different um, support groups. So I think there's been a change in the content, a dialing up of the frequency um, and then we actually in some markets have been lucky enough to have some of the sort of office operations or executive admin staff take on a much more formal engagement role. And particularly the guy that's been doing this in Australia is just fantastic. And so he, he basically has an activity on, on Slack every single day. Uh, and it'll be things like, you know, post something you built this week with your own hands or post a photo of a place that you'd rather be or you know we now have meme meme mondays and these things might seem really sort of frivolous but it has really helped people have a laugh feel connected it's brought some lightness to i think what is a um a pretty heavy and monotonous time for a lot of people and and so i think those are some just really practical tactical examples of uh of what we've done differently yeah, they're wonderful examples and and they show the scope uh, that there is to really um, be much more authentically <laughs> present uh, to, to others, even if it's through a virtual medium. So Susan, what about you? What are some of the things that, that 
you and your team have done? We've done um, very uh, similar things to Jodie, but I'll, I'll just draw on a couple that Jodie didn't mention so that I don't go over the same um, sorts of things. I think having a really clear focus with your team and your whole staff is important. Um, I think that right in the early days, I used a, a visual image of the Starship, Starship Enterprise and Captain Kirk, because that's how I felt um, going into remote learning the first time because we were navigating the unknown, we were boldly going where no school has gone before, I think were the words that I said, um, and that we identified three elements early on, and we kept coming back to those. And I think giving um, a clear focus and identifying what the important things are is important. So our three elements were maintaining connection beyond yourself to the community, understanding you're still part of a community, even if you're not physically there being very mindful of sustainability so whatever we come up with to do it has to be sustainable and then the importance of communication and communicating in a range of different ways but another thing that we found really important and i don't think we realized the importance of it at the time was as jody said using the structures that you have but trying to maintain a sense of normality and so one of the things that we did that not all schools did is we decided to stay with the timetable so um, we, we didn't change our day structure for our families. Um, we, we kept it the same. And that didn't mean the teacher was up front and teaching and speaking at the students um, through Zoom for, for 75 minutes, but it meant that period one on a Monday, it might be English, you had access to your teacher in that time and you did a range of different things. We found that really, really powerful. And we also agreed as teachers and leaders that we would have within that 75 minutes, within that lesson, there would always be an online connection where you saw each other, you saw your students. And all the way through, that's been um, incredibly um, important. So trying to keep things, even though it has to be slightly different, that sense of what we've always done, I think was important too. And for many of our families where that dislocation or disconnection is there anyway, we found that really, really helpful. Checking conversations so that everything's not um, online was important and we used our large leadership team and structures to do that. So every fortnight we rang every family and we spoke to every set of parents um, and we checked in with students um, so that we were doing it through the different platforms and, uh, and through um, email but we actually had a phone call conversation. I remember one parent saying this is the first time I've used the phone to actually have a conversation in two weeks. But um, that was really helpful and parents knew we could do that. We established a wellbeing hotline, which was um, 24 hours and we monitored that, we shared that amongst the leadership team. So if somebody had a question, um, they could call us. And we used a range of different technology. We even on Anzac Day, because our school is one of the oldest in the state and, and the first principal fought at Gallipoli. And so Anzac Day is a big deal. And we always have this big assembly and it's a huge, it's, it's right across the wider community and we couldn't do that. So um, we had me laying a wreath by myself outside that we videoed and um, loaded through Vimeo, which was a little bit sad. But I also made um, in my own kitchen, having my husband using an iPhone to, to, to film me make Anzac biscuits for the community. Now, I was a bit embarrassed and uh, we had to edit some of my language um, as things went wrong um, throughout the cooking process. But um, what was really powerful about it, and we got so much feedback from the families, and you've got no idea how many people watched it, um, was people didn't want to know um, how to make Anzac biscuits. They wanted to see my kitchen. And it was huge for them that they got to come into my house. Yeah. And um, one of the things that we found through this whole process is the strengthening of relationships and the change of power dynamics within our community. Um, because my leaders have come into my house, they've seen me in my hoodie, uh, which um, is amazing for them. Students didn't even know that I wore runners. So that's been a, um, a whole new learning um, for them is that um, things like that have been really powerful. And the final thing I would touch on is the acknowledgement. Acknowledgement is really, really important. The acknowledgement, the explicit acknowledgement of that this is a crisis. Mm -hmm. I remember our wellbeing team person doing a presentation and he talked about, this is not stressful, this is trauma. Mm -hmm. That was really powerful for the lots of us, that we're in a pandemic and that will have an impact. And here are some strategies and, and this is what you can do, but just be mindful of that and kind to yourself that this is an extraordinary situation that we are all going through, and then acknowledging people's contribution. 
So my PA is still not speaking to me about the ideas I've had around this. But the first remote learning, by the end of the term, we organised for um, a card with a picture of me and the student leaders and signatures from all the school council thanking staff for their contribution. And we gave them a school scarf in the school colours and we left it on their desk. And it had a huge impact. People loved it. They thought it was great, but they didn't care about the scarf. It was the fact that people had hand signed the card. So the second time, because we'd had double of the time away and it had been even more traumatic, I decided that um, what we would do is that we divide the 235 staff amongst the leadership team and we do another card, but this time it would have a personal message which would outline one contribution that they had made, just one thing, and it would be handwritten. And because we couldn't travel anywhere, there was a seed pack of a spice mix that said that although you can't travel, your taste buds can. And we put that in the card and we mailed it to their home so that during the school holidays, they would get this uh, and they would open it. And there were times when I was writing my 37 personal messages that I wondered whether this had been a good idea at all. And my poor PA who had to put 235 packs together, uh, I think was cursing me um, at key points but the impact of it has been huge. Mm. The fact that people take the time to recognise some great work you do is incredibly powerful. Mm. Mm. Fantastic. Uh, lots of lovely examples there. <laughs> Appearing in your hoodie and your runners. <laughs> so um, I'm going to just ask one more question before uh, we, we go to the broader questions. And this is about the, um, you know, your insights around uh, ethics in leadership and, you know, the evidence is that the effects of the negative effects, particularly of COVID, have fallen really unevenly. Uh, it suggests that those in the bottom socioeconomic strata in the most vulnerable parts of our community have suffered most from this. And, you know, both of you in different ways have got access and have uh, connections to those communities. So I'm just interested in your reflections about how you've responded to some of those issues in your work. And perhaps um, I'll start with you this time, Susan. Your, some of your- um, it, It's a hard one because um, I don't have a lot of measure. I only have the community um, that I serve and I, I take care of. So, um, and they are incredibly um, disadvantaged. And I, I don't think um, I, at the start of this, realised the impact of that. So um, probably the thing, that, the visual image I will take out of this crisis for me is we had a family that had some positive cases within the family. So they have nine children. And in the end, all um, eight of them tested positive um, and they couldn't um, leave their house. And we got to the point that we had to deliver food for them um, and leave food um, on um, the doorstep. So we, some of the disadvantage that we experience is incredible and um, way outside uh, my personal experience. Mm. And I think what we've tried to do all the way through this is we've tried to provide resources. Um, so in the first remote learning, we provided 600 laptops um, to families plus dongles and uh, internet access and we're supported by the department to do that. So we've tried very much to do that. Um, but, but I think the challenge for me is trying to understand what the impact is and will actually look like. Yeah. Um, it's funny, um, and I'm probably not answering your question, Amanda, but it's funny, um, I've got a big challenge at the moment that I'm really grappling with because I've got 260 or 70 parents that um, are going to be our year seven parents from next for next year. So we've got potentially 270 year sevens. And just trying to grapple with um, doing online transition and supporting them through a time which is already quite uh, full of anxiety because it's the unknown, but doing it at a time where they haven't really had grade six at their own school. They've got all the grief around that. They haven't been able to come on site and have the normal tours, the normal connection, the normal program we would have. And how do you do that when a lot of them don't speak English, not all of them have computers, um, is really challenging, I think. And so um, we, we're really grappling with that. We're doing everything we can. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we have learned is the importance of going to the families themselves. Again, as I said in my first comment, not making assumptions about mm -hmm. what they need, because if we're doing that, then we're bringing our middle 
a class-wide experience to that. And sometimes we actually uh, miss the mark. Yeah. The, and the final thing I'll say before I hand over to Jody is just that I said to my leadership team yesterday, we, we're all talking about um, the impact of COVID um, on mental health and well-being, particularly of disadvantaged um, learners. And um, the education minister said that, you know, it will be our communities, my community, that will be most hit by this. But it's, that, again, is still an assumption and a guess. I don't think we'll know what the impact of this will be now. And I think um, it may take a period of time before that becomes um, really, really clear. Evident. Thanks, Susan. What about your experience, Jody? I think this has been really interesting uh, in my position from sort of at least three angles. One is the team, one is the small businesses that we partner with, and then one is the independent contractors or the delivery partners that we um, that use our platform. And they have all had challenges in different ways. I think we've talked a lot about the team and, and you know, the, um, the headline on the team front, I think Susan and I, you know, are in fierce agreement with it's, you know, be aware, don't make assumptions and then be flexible as much as you can uh, in how you respond as, as well as, you know, thoughtful and, and authentic and all of those things. I, I think um, the the really challenging piece through COVID has been how to best support small businesses and independent contractors um, in different markets that are at different stages uh, of um, COVID and restrictions uh, and therefore consequences for their earning potential. And, uh, you know, Uber is a very polarizing brand. Uh, we are not, in my um, view portrayed very fairly in the press at all. So, you know, be, be careful what you believe when you read the paper. Um, I really, really believe that if those partners don't succeed, then our business can't succeed. So with that in mind, we have had to really thoughtfully navigate what do small businesses and independent contractors need especially during this time, but always. And for small businesses, uh, I think it was really delivery as a matter of survival in lots of places where their dining trade just disappeared overnight. And so it became giving them a way to continue to access customers, helping them with cash, relieve some cash flow issues, uh, and then working out ways that we could give them um, some margin relief through certain channels. So, for example, offering free uh, pickup through the app, which we had certainly in markets like Australia, um, so that if they couldn't afford to use delivery, at least customers could still find and access their menus and their food without needing to uh, pay a third party any money. So um, I think driving demand to those small businesses, and, and in fact, in Australia, we did that over and above enterprises which was a really difficult conversation to have with big valuable partners uh, that we do business with because most of the package uh, that we announced in March only went to our small business restaurants, not to enterprise partners. So saying, you know, it is a time to really look out for the small guys and understand they need continued customer demand. They need um, cash flow relief so we move to things like daily payments instead of weekly or, or, or fortnightly um, giving them access to free or super low cost channels and it was very much you know like listen act listen act what do you need what do you need this week okay month one has gone by how is that feeling is that working um, and doing that at scale you know we've got in australia more than thirty thousand individual storefronts um, and in Japan and Taiwan, the numbers are, are, are higher than that. How do you actually provide that level of care at scale? And that's really, really hard. Um, so I think we've, we've kind of been doing a lot on the fly um, and learning as we go. On, on the independent contractor front, um, particularly if you follow the news in the US, I think COVID has really brought this argument to a head. I think more than ever, access to flexible work, and there's two key words there, access and flexible, 
are absolutely critical. You know, we've got unemployment at record highs in multiple places. Uh, it is so easy to get online and um, work when you want and where you want as an Uber driver or delivery partner using the platform. And that is a very important role to play, especially in temporary times of crisis. And that existed before COVID and continues to exist now. Mm. Now, you know, there's lots of talk about, is the independent contractor model right? Uh, you'll see from what the CEO has written and what I believe that driver and delivery partners do prefer to remain independent so they can preserve their flexibility. But, and there's a big but, uh, independent work is not perfect. And so the battle that we have and that we are fighting with those who support independent contractor work is how do we get better entitlements for independent contractors without having to shift into the only alternative right now, which is full-time work, which is not consistent with our business model. So it is about really continuing for people who need, really desperately need access to flexible work. How do we continue to provide that and how do we make the conditions for those people better while continuing to advocate for more sort of legal and um, regulatory freedom to do that, you know, to provide all of the perks and benefits that traditionally come with, um, with full-time work? We believe that there's no reason that independent contractors shouldn't have access to that. Fantastic, fantastic to hear about all that learning on the fly too that, that both of you have been doing. We've got a lot of Q&A there. It, you know, it really keeps coming back to this same thing of just not assuming that people are in the same situation as you are. And so I actually have found myself in the habit of asking at the beginning of most meetings that I have, whether that's one-on-one -on -one or group, um, you know, tell me where uh, your city's at or your country's at this week. Uh, what's happening on the COVID front? What are restrictions like? What are you able to do at the moment? Um, and you also get that a little bit from the um, tell me about your weekend question, which is sort of less direct, but certainly enlightening because people who are in pretty heavy restrictions will say, well, you know, I stayed home because I'm not allowed to go anywhere. <laughs> and, and so I think opening with that seemingly benign question, I think, tells a huge story uh, depending on, you know, who I'm talking to in which market. It tells, tells me a lot about their personal circumstance. Um, I think on the, on the original question of how do you deal with people from your team who are in Melbourne who are having a worse experience than others, I actually think it's really hard. And we have majority of our team in Sydney. And I think a lot of the time they do forget about the Melbourne experience. And so it just takes Melbourne people speaking up, one, to advocate for themselves uh, and saying, sorry, remember us, we're still in a pretty shitty situation. Um, and uh, and then just making sure that you reset when that's been uh, when that's been brought to life. But I think you know the Melbourne folks do have some responsibility to remind the people that they're working with of their circumstances. I think it's really difficult as a leader when your team makes you guess the difficulties that they're going through, um, and they don't flag when they're having a hard time. So I, I would say that responsibility should be shared. And one of the things, just one of the things that I would add is just um, certainly um, we, we've used learning stories a lot, so sharing stories and, and uh, whether it's a, a lesson with adults, so it's a leadership session with adults or it's a professional learning with adults or it's with children for us, although we're all in Victoria and we're all under um, restrictions, is that we, we, we chunk things, we break things up. We've got um, activities and wellbeing activities that sit amongst the learning where there's an opportunity for people to share their thinking. Um, and I think that's really, really important. And just looking at the, the delivery, whether it's online or, or you, we've, we've had a situation this week where half of our students are back and half of our students are not so we're trying to run lessons or we're trying to run um, meetings with staff and we've got some at school and some at home and some in the car 
um, and some walking to the car park and you're trying to, to, to do that. And I think um, we always start now with a warm-up activity um, to get us into the headspace of the work we're about to do, whether you're students or not. And part of that warm-up activity is a check-in about where I am now, not just in location, but where I am in my headspace now so that you can park that so you can focus on what you're about to do. Mm. Well, I was just going to follow up with uh, there's a couple of questions that have come up in the Q&A around sustaining some new habits. So really interested to hear from you both. What are you doing really differently as a result of COVID that you want to keep going and, and how are you thinking about sustaining that? How are, you, how are you going to keep that momentum on those things? Well, I might jump in first, Jodie, if that's okay. I think um, so far I've talked a lot about the challenges that I've faced and I haven't really highlighted the fantastic experiences and learnings that we've had. And I have to say, I'm so proud of um, my community. We've done amazing things. I think in some respects, in the middle of the year, we have to do, um, at schools, you have to do a, a mid-year evaluation of the goals that you set and the targets that you're trying to reach. And it was amazing. We've actually, we've met them all um, and we were on track and we'll meet every time that we set at the start of the year. It's just the way we got there is totally different <laughs> to what we plan to do. Um, and um, so I think um, some fantastic things have happened, particularly around three key areas. And I think that comes back to the learning stories for us is identifying what key learnings, what great success have we had and the importance of not losing those and, and, and making sure they're embedded in our practice. And the we take responsibility as a whole community, teachers, students and parents, for holding on to that. And the, the, the real strengths or the, the, um, the areas that um, jump out for me around the strength between parents um, and school, the connection between parents and school, the strengthening of those relationships, because we've had to do that. Plato said necessity is the mother of invention and boy was he right, um, because you've got to find different ways. And so that connection between the home and school has been closer than ever before. And we want to hold on to that. And we want to explore all the technology and all the different ways um, to keep that going. Many of our students, particularly those that rarely questioned or raised their hand in class have found their voice through this. Mm -hmm. Particularly our first phase learners, um, our transition EAL students um, use chat function to ask questions and to share their thinking. They've been really empowered and our students have had to have a sense of agency and responsibility in their learning and we don't want to lose that. We don't want them come by, coming back to sit passively and listen to the teacher go through content because they've had to inquire and they've had to discover and they've had to um, answer questions and ask questions themselves. So, so we definitely want to hold on to that. And technology has, I hate technology. I've learned more about technology than I ever hoped to. And at some point I want to lose that knowledge completely. But I think um, there are some incredible opportunities through it that I didn't even think about. And I won't go back to that. So the idea of um, having a staff meeting online so that people can come in and out and, and that flexibility, um, we will continue um, to use because it, um, it's great, it's effective, it saves time, it means you can focus um, on other things. And the final thing, the key learning um, from, from many staff, the biggest move forward in terms of pedagogy for us, which is the science of teaching and improving practice. For three years, we focused on coming up with a, a, a model of, the, of what great practice looks like in the classroom and what I want our teachers to do. And we've battled with that with staff um, and we've supported them and we've challenged them. We've still got inconsistencies across the school. We've made greater gains in that, in them understanding what the model means and looks like day to day in their classroom when they couldn't go in their classroom than over the last 18 months because suddenly it's not like they've had new learning they just suddenly understand why we've been focusing on what we have for the last two years and they've said now I get it um, and so they've come back and they're very different teachers and I'm incredibly proud of that and their resilience around that and the fact that they're prepared to say that they're, they're making themselves vulnerable in sharing their learning with others and saying you know now I get it. Yeah fantastic thanks Susan. Jodie. Um, I think on a personal note, the two things that have really stood out are um, the lack of travel, but what that means into the future is when is a 
face-to-face -face interaction really critical. And I think the default before was just getting on a plane because you just got on a plane. Uh, and, you know, we know the impact on the planet's not ideal, but also really takes a personal toll on, on people uh, who have to travel a lot. And, and so I think just being really acutely aware that we've thrived as a business in most ways without any travel at all. Um, and so really rethinking when does it actually matter? When does it really have value to get on a plane and, and come together in person? Uh, and I think that's generally a positive, both sort of commercially and personally. Mm. Um, I think the second thing is it has, I think, elevated the... Um, I don't know, plight makes it sound like it's really dire, but just the situation, the experience of parents uh, who work full time. And it has probably been the single biggest kind of unveiling uh, of maybe like silent suffering that happened before. And I think that has been just a huge leap forward for us as a business who typically hire, um, you know, a younger population of um, employees, you know, that's the demographic of Uber. Now the company is kind of growing up. There's a lot of parents, there's a lot of new parents and really just getting our heads around, how can you function more flexibly for caregivers in general? Uh, and, and I think that that will really stick and we've probably made five years of progress in six months. Um, on, the, on the commercial front, um, I think what has stuck uh, two ways of working and then just a commercial truth. I think the ways of working, um, it's really interesting if you do a lot of online meetings, if you've ever been on one where you're the only person or there's a couple of people who are on Zoom and everybody else is in a room, it's actually a terrible experience for both sides. And when everybody's at home, it has a really level playing field of each person being you know, by themselves on the screen. And I actually think that's much better uh, online meeting practice than having a huddle of people in the room who can have side conversations and eye contact and all of those things. So um, I'd, I'd like to keep that level playing field. Um, and the second thing that I was going to say was, I think it has really sparked a new level of... Um, sort of creativity and, you know, sometimes we use the word hustle at Uber, which I don't love, but just a reminder that things are never as they seem and you can't rely on anything. And so you always have to sort of be on your toes and reimagining the way things can be, which we are compared to the rest of the world of, of business pretty good at, but I think it really um, kind of refreshed that. Uh, and then the final one, which I think is the, the sort of commercial truth that's been accelerated that on-demand delivery um, is not a question mark anymore. It's a part of life, um, whether people like it or not. And so that has really quickly accelerated businesses like ours, but just really thinking about how do you get uh, things to people in a way that, um, particularly in Australia, we were pretty uh, archaic in the way that we thought about that, but it, ha it has just catapulted us sort of five or 10 years forward um, in a very fast way. Fantastic. I'm going to hand back to Jill um, just to draw a few things together. I think we're almost out of time, yeah? You're on mute. Okay, now, how, how's that? Yeah. Okay, all right, good. Thanks very much. Um, so, um, Amanda, did you want to sort of address any themes that you saw coming through this? Yeah, so look, just as part of, of, of bringing things to a close, uh, I really just wanted to thank you both. There, there is so much in what you've both said, um, both at a kind of a reimagining, to pick up on your um, term, Jody. Like, uh, in, in the way that you're going about leadership, which I think is just going to be so inspiring for our audience and certainly has been for me and Jill, I know. But also right through to the practical level. I mean, I'm not sure that I'll do the, the baking of the Anzacs, but that <laughs> idea that uh, you can be a really effective, authentic leader by showing more of yourself and allowing some vulnerability, I think is, is, is a fantastic uh, takeaway as well, uh, in addition to all of the 
uh, the tips and, um, you know, ingenious innovations that, you, that you've both sort of come up with. And, and you know, I'm sure it's a, a, collective, a collective accomplishment, but, uh, you know, I really, really appreciate uh, that picture that, that leadership can really reshape the world of work going forward uh, in, an, in exciting, in uh, diverse, in inclusive ways. It, it's, it's a fantastic picture that you've painted for us today. So thank you very much. Yeah, and I would like to add, uh, add my thanks to both Jody and Susan and to uh, Amanda for being um, such a, a wonderful facilitator of this discussion. Um, we'd also like uh, to thank our attendees for coming and to encourage you to leave us some feedback. And um, we'd also like to invite you to join us at other upcoming events, which are showing on your screen now. Uh, so more in the uh, women in leadership and a uh, couple of other uh, talks and events that are coming up. So we welcome you to come join us for those. So thank you very much to everyone for this, this very interesting and fruitful conversation. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs>